Kicking off the list at number 10, the Stellar Sea Cow. Stellar indeed, okay. The Stellar Sea Cow was named after George Wilhelm Stellar, who discovered this massive creature in 1741 during the Vitus Bering's Great Northern Expedition. They found her right after the crew became shipwrecked. What a lovely surprise to an otherwise horrible situation. They were around over 2.6 million years ago and they were no match for humans. They only swam about a meter deep and once humans came into the picture with you know hunting and aggression and everything, they were quite easy to hunt. George Stellar commented that the animals had an uncommon love for their families, which in turn made it even easier for us to hunt them. Considering the one year gestation period, the species just couldn't reproduce fast enough to keep up with our hunting. But this list, we have a little hope now, don't we? Scientists were able to sequence the genome, which could mean we could see the creature again one day, hopefully. The answer may lie right now in the DNA of a dugong. Dugongs are the cow of the sea. You know what, they're great. Let's have all the cows of all seas back immediately. Number nine, passenger pigeons. The passenger pigeon once ruled the skies over Canada as recently as the 19th century. Billions of these bright orange birds would just paint the skies. They would fly in flocks so large, it would block out the sun for a short amount of time. Isn't that beautiful? It's like some Lion King stuff right there. But only a few decades passed and passenger pigeons are now no more. So what happened? Well, the very last passenger pigeon, her name was Martha. She passed away in the Cincinnati Zoo back in 1914. So we took a look at her DNA to see if Martha held any secrets to her extinction. They discovered Martha had a low genetic diversity for such a growing population. Natural selection and hunting obviously just eliminated the coolest looking bird out there by far. A little different than the pigeons we have today, that's for sure. The last one died in 1914, but in 2019, paleontologists found remains of the pigeon protected in indigenous lands in Canada, up in Northwest Territories. They blended passenger pigeon DNA with Archaeopteryx dinosaur DNA. Yeah, we're bringing back pigeons with a hint Oh, dinosaur. What could go wrong? Number eight, the woolly mammoth. It was announced only months ago that a team of scientists and entrepreneurs over at a company called Colossal are planning to bring back, are planning to bring the woolly mammoth back to life. That's just the thing we need right now in this world. Out of all the problems, we're like, you know what could solve it? The woolly mammoth, for sure. That'll bring jobs back. The Siberian tundra thousands of years ago was once full of these woolly mammoths, but climate change began to slow them down just a little bit. And humans also needed food, so that surely didn't help. These guys provided warmth and, well, look at them, obviously, a lot of food. Genetics company Colossal raised over $15 million to try and bring this thing back to life. Honestly, I hope it works, but then, I mean, now what? All these things are great scientifically, but it's like, and then what? Number seven, the dodo bird. Speaking of the devil, this is, we're definitely going to eat these guys. Dodo birds were once big and beautiful. These flightless ground nesting birds once filled the island of Meritius, located in the Indian Ocean. They had massive talons, they were big gray and blue, and they didn't have any natural predator, which is pretty sweet. They didn't have one until we came along. Around 1507, the island was discovered by Portuguese sailors and, well, the rest is history. They were the easiest bird to hunt, hence the phrase dead as a dodo. They weren't just loved by sailors either. We're not just 100% here to blame, you know? Monkeys, rats, pigs, any animal that made its way to the island easily had their eggs for lunch. So yeah, it didn't take a long time for the dodo bird population to be completely wiped out. The last dodo was hunted in 1681, but can we bring back the dodo bird? Are we doing it? I think we're gonna do it. Scientists found an extremely well-preserved dodo skeleton back in 2007, so we may have a chance at picking some DNA apart here. A research facility near Melbourne, Australia is currently trying to use pigeon genes to bring this bird back to life. I mean, I'm all for the idea of bringing back an animal. Scientifically, that's a feat in itself, but do we really think nobody's gonna make dodo chicken wings? I'm just saying. That's just a problem waiting to happen. Number six, Pyrenean Ibex. The last Pyrenean Ibex was a female named Celia. A falling tree sadly killed her in 2000. She was a subspecies of the Spanish Ibex and the Pyrenean Ibex were native to the Pyrenees Mountains on the border of Spain and France, as her name hints towards. Back in the medieval ages though, their population was reduced drastically to an endangered level. So it wasn't just recently, it was way back, you know, because of, again, Hi, we got hungry. They were all over the place and knights and swords and bows and armies to feed. They were hunted down, sadly. Disease spread by humans also played an important role in their demise during this time. The Pyrenean Ibex was successfully cloned and brought back from extinction for seven minutes. So we actually did this one. DNA from the last living lady was implanted in the womb of a domestic goat. Lung complications are why the clone didn't last, but listen to what I just said. They made a clone. Seven minutes is a start. I think I could handle a clone of myself for seven minutes and then after that I'm tapping out. Number five, Tasmanian Tiger. Once native to Australia, the Tasmanian Tiger, also known as the thylakine, 
It was a massive carnivorous marsupial that went extinct around the 1930s. Major factors here, as you guessed, climate change, hunting, and its genetic diversity wasn't all too great. It was sad on one hand because these beautiful creatures disappeared so recently, but it's recent enough that we have a shot at bringing them back. So we're like, ah, oh, but maybe, maybe. Yeah, imagine looking outside and seeing this thing on your front yard. Are we ready for this? Specimens still remain preserved in jars. Thank God for those jars. It's about time we open those things up, right? All those jar guys are like, hmm, finally, pull this one out. Already we have some of the Tasmanian tiger genes present after scientists inserted them into a mouse fetus. The Australian Museum has been working hard to bring this beast back to life. They're only still lacking the DNA to fully recreate it. So if you have any jars of Tasmanian tiger parts, you know, help us out, hit those thumbs. Number four, the great auk. Once thriving in colonies off North Atlantic coasts, the great auk would grow to 30 inches long and its tiny wings would be only used to swim. Had little tiny, little wings. The wings were much smaller, they were about 13 centimeters long, little flappy arms. No wonder they couldn't fly, look at these things, oh my God. They were cute, but obviously they were quite defenseless. Around the 1500s, European fishermen discovered this perfect area for hunting, and it just happened to be where most of these great ox were hanging out. Newfoundland looked like the iceberg from Club Penguin, and then we just rolled in and we're like, ho oh, ho ho, we are so hungry. It was packed, so they rapidly declined, and by 1950, the last two known specimens were hunted by a single fisherman on Eldi Island just off the coast of Iceland. Scientists plan on using genetic information extracted from their fossils or preserved organs. Remember those jars of organs always coming in handy. They plan on editing their DNA in the closest living species, which is now the razor-billed auk. The organization Revive and Restore is behind the wheel on this one, and I'm hoping they pull through. Number three, the moa. This New Zealand bird went extinct about 600 years ago. Moa were these flightless birds, massive, might I add, and archaeologists first discovered its fossil in a cave. Its flesh and everything was still attached. That's the gross part. These ancient birds would reach about five feet tall, and when you think of dinosaurs, you probably think that's quite petite in comparison. These birds stopped flying right after the dinosaurs went extinct. Interesting timing. According to biologist Matthew Phillips from the Australian National University in Canberra, these birds safely roamed the land after they didn't need to make these daring dino escapes in the sky. They walked around, got fat, and would hang out in caves. Honestly, pretty ideal. Phillips says this is an advantage when it comes to birds and evolution because wings, be it big or small, kill energy. So it might seem a little depressing to watch a creature lose the ability to fly, but it's because they're eating good, they're comfortable now. Scientists have now found more MOA DNA from ancient eggshells, so it's possible that we may see these fatties throw the skies once again. Number two, Megatherium aka giant ground sloths. That's a bit of a nicer name. Yeah, sloths, let's bring those back. Wait, they're already here, hmm? I'm confused, Taylor. Sloths used to be a lot bigger than we think. We often look at them now for being so slow and silly. The movie Ice Age or Zootopia, they sure didn't help their case. Now, of course, the giant ground sloth is closely related to our modern three-toed sloth, but luckily for us, today's sloths aren't that big. They're not the same size as an elephant, which is pretty sweet. That would be a horror film. If a giant elephant-sized sloth started to climb that tree, slowly, might I add, ugh, I'd be sick. We may be able to bring this one back, although they died off 8,000 years ago. DNA samples were extracted from their hair remains, so the next step now is to develop a fetus in an artificial womb. That's the hard part. That's where science and technology might just do the rest. But as of right now, we just we've got a pile of hair. We're like, maybe. And finally, number one, the gastric brooding frog. I'm a big fan of frogs and toads, all that stuff. Except for when they hatch eggs out of their back. That's arguably the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. We'll maybe show you after, maybe, I don't know. These gastric brooding frogs would swallow their eggs and then hatch them out of their mouth. So if you watch them give birth in reverse, it would be pretty confusing. That would be a horror film. They went extinct back in 1983, but scientists have figured out how to implant these dead cells into a fresh egg from an entirely different frog species. Let's just hope these new ones aren't born out of your back. Starting off this countdown, we have the California condor. The California condor is the largest vulture and land bird in North America. From tip to tip, its wings stretch about 10 feet. It's got a big wingspan. They also can fly as high as 15,000 feet in the air. Now these vultures used to live all throughout the southwestern US into northwestern Mexico. But during the 20th century, their population started to decline due to pesticides, poaching, and loss of habitat. By 1987, there were so few left that scientists declared them extinct. During that time, there were only about 27 or less in the wild. 
But don't worry, the US government actually helped save these animals. They created a captive breeding program and set it up in a number of zoos across the country. This program is said to be one of the most expensive conservation projects in US history. It cost about $35 million and $2 million per year to keep it up. And slowly but surely, they helped increase the amount of condors. As of 2019, their population is at 118. Some of the birds have even been reintroduced into the wild. They are still at risk, but all the birds are tagged and the US are keeping a close eye on them to make sure they never get near extinction ever again. In our ninth spot today, we have the Somali elephant shrew. Now don't be fooled, this isn't an elephant, but it does have a long pointed snout like an elephant. It's as small as a mouse and kind of looks like one too, but they aren't actually a shrew, that rhymed. In fact, they are related to aardvarks, elephants, and manatees. You heard me correctly, these tiny little creatures are related to elephants and manatees. How? I, I, don't, I don't understand nature. Anyways, the last recorded sighting of this creature was in the 1970s. After that, scientists declared the species extinct. That was until August of 2020. A team of researchers were out doing studies when they came across these tiny little creatures. From there, they decided to try and see how many elephant shrews were left in the wild. So they set up more than 1,000 traps with a tasty treat of peanut butter, oatmeal, and yeast inside. In total, they came across 12 elephant shrews of the same species. Now, thousands of these little guys are back and are no longer threatened or in danger. Moving on to number eight, we have the Bermuda petrel. This is the second rarest seabird on the planet. In fact, it was last seen on Nonsuch Island in 1620. They literally thought it was extinct for over 300 years. They went extinct because their habitat was destroyed by sea erosion and hurricanes. But then in the 1950s, they were like, surprise, no, we're here, we're here to stay, we're just playing. So in the 1950s, their nest was spotted east of Bermuda with a few birds nearby. In 1951, 36 of these birds were rediscovered. And as of 2021, their population is increasing. The government created new nesting sites for these seabirds. And as of spring 2020, there are a total of 134 breeding pairs. We went from 18 to 134. Hell yeah. But according to conservation officer Jeremy Madrios, he said, and I quote, it's an ongoing recovery, an example for threatened species around the world in an era when encroachment on and destruction of habitats is putting more species at risk than ever before. Well spoken. In our seventh spot today, we have the horned marsupial frogs. These little guys are so freaking cute. Like, just look at them. They have like weird pointy eyeball horns. But its eye horns aren't the only thing that makes this frog pretty weird. Its eggs develop in a pouch on the female's back. And when they hatch, you got fully formed frogs instead of tadpoles. That's pretty unusual for frogs. Anyways, these frogs live in the tropical rainforest in Ecuador. But due to habitat loss from oil palm crops, timber, and mining, the frogs went extinct around 2005. They were declared extinct for 13 years until 2018 when they made a comeback. Since extinction, they now have a population of 350 with 18 new species. Moving on to number six, we have the Takahi. The Takahi are flightless birds that are native to New Zealand. They honestly kind of look like peacocks without the big colorful feathers. It's because they have the same bluey, greeny colorway. In the 1890s, their population began to decline due to hunting, competition for food, predators, and habitat loss. By 18 they were declared extinct. But then, 50 years later, a small group of them were discovered high in the Murchison Mountains. As of 2019, the population is 418. It is said to be growing at a rate of 10% per year, slowly but surely. In fact, the rediscovery of this bird inspired New Zealand's longest running endangered species program. It's been in the works for more than 70 years now, with plans to make sure that this animal or any other animal never becomes extinct again, as well as they help save endangered species. We're now at our fifth and halfway mark with the Tarsier. These are one of the cutest animals to ever exist. Just look at it. It looks like a cute little weird monkey, squirrel, alien thing. Like, I want one as a pet. 
Anyways, this interesting creature is considered a nocturnal primate, but scientists still don't know much about it. One of the reasons being is that scientists thought that they went extinct in the 1920s. But in May of 2000, while checking a rat trap that they had set up in a forest, scientists discovered that they had actually accidentally caught a tar seer. Sadly though, this little dude was dead. But still, they were like, oh shoot, these creatures are back. Then in 2008, researchers found a family of them in Lore Lindu National Park. Nowadays, it's believed that there are only 5,000 to 10,000 of these animals in the whole world. And that number is sadly falling again instead of rising. It's because these little creatures don't live too long in captivity. In fact, when they are in distress, they apparently try and take their own lives. So that's a reason why it's hard to look after these little guys and keep them off of the endangered list. In our fourth spot today, we have the Golden Lion Tamarin. But I like to call it the Golden Majestic Monkey. Like, look at this thing! Look at its luscious locks. It's got nicer hair than me. Anyways, this orange primate is located in Brazil's Atlantic Forest. But sadly, with its habitat being destroyed, the population is at great risk. In the early 1970s, so few of them were alive in the wild that they were declared extinct. But with the help from the World Wildlife Federation, public charities, and 150 zoos, Brazil's government has been able to help these monkeys. There's now a healthy population of them being looked after by zoos all over the world. Plus, they have already breeded and reintroduced around 1,700 of these majestic guys back into the wild. It's sad, but the main threat these guys face is urbanization of the area. They're losing space to call home, and that's what's putting them at risk the most. Moving on to number three, we have Catagonus wagneri. Now, these animals are weird because just look at them. They look like gray hairy pigs or warthogs, but you know, without the little horns. Either way, I still find them cute. Back in the day, this creature was discovered from early fossil records. Then in 1974, a biology professor from University of Connecticut was on a National Geographic research expedition when he rediscovered these creatures. And they are no longer considered endangered or extinct. A huge population of them live in a 2400 acre area in Grand Chaco. They hide out in the bushy thorny areas so that they are safe from jaguars and pumas and local hunters. Another huge population resides in the Tagua Sanctuary at the CCCI Conservation Center. In our second spot today, we have the Tasmanian Devil. Not the dude from Looney Tunes. Don't worry, he's still being animated and he is well. Anyways, the Tasmanian Devil used to be found all over the place, but now they are only found on the island state of Tasmania. Around 3,000 years ago, these creatures went extinct because of predation. They were being hunted by the dingo. And then they were hit by the devil facial tumor disease, which is a contagious form of cancer. This spread like wildfire and killed 90% of the population. As a result, they were declared extinct. But over the years, the creatures were reintroduced to wildlife sanctuaries and have been introduced in New South Wales in Australia. This has helped save the population. Plus, the population is thriving in Tasmania, as there are no dingoes there to hurt them. And in our number one spot today, we have the Silocanth. The Silocanth, which is spelled nothing like it's pronounced, I thought it would be like Coela Camp, <laughs> but no, I guess not. Anyways, these dudes have the most famous comeback story of all time. These fish were said to have been around when the dinosaurs were alive. That's right, that's how old these dudes are. In the 19th century, that's when scientists discovered a fossil of this fish. The fossils were said to be over 410 million years old. It's said that they went extinct around 66 million years ago. That was until 1938 when they were rediscovered off the coast of South Africa. That has to be the greatest comeback of all time. They still are critically endangered, but the fact that they managed to survive millions of years is absolutely insane. Number 10, the dodo. In the words of my roommate, dodo. Classic. Perhaps one of the most infamous extinctions known to man was that of the dodo bird. When humans met the dodo bird, they were literally eaten to death within 80 years, I think, of their discovery. They were easy to catch, and as their name suggests, they weren't the 
they weren't the smartest. But guys, there are some really exciting things happening in the world of genetics, and finally, scientists are on the way to bringing them back. After collecting various DNA samples, in January 2016, the University of California announced they have completed the genome sequence of the dodo bird, opening a variety of doors. With this new information, scientists may be able to recover enough DNA to create a clone to implant in the eggs of the closely related modern pigeon. Oh. Number nine, the thylacine. The story of the last known thylacine or Tasmanian tiger is very sad. His name was Benjamin, and after thousands of his species were eradicated for fear that they'd eat Australia's cattle, he was the last one left. He was a resident in the Bomera Sioux in Hobart for a while, until one night, out of neglect, they didn't let him back into the kennel. He died of exposure, and his body was thrown into a dump. So sad. But Michael Archer believes we owe it to Benjamin to bring him back. There is one surviving sample of the thylacine that was pickled, pickled in alcohol. Unfortunately, some of the samples were contaminated by careless human DNA, so people reaching in going, ooh, look, it's so weird, and then dropping it back in. But the teeth contained viable samples. In fact, they were able to splice the thylacine cells successfully with a mouse. Archer even argues that should we be able to bring them back, that they could thrive in the Tasmanian ecosystem still, as not much has changed. As we will discover on this list, there's a lot we can do now when it comes to cloning, so it is only a matter of time before we see them again. Number eight, aurochs. You may may have never heard of aurochs, but they are one of the most important creatures to have ever walked this earth. They are the great great grandparents of all living cattle today, so I guess you better thank them for the burger you're barbecuing. Aurochs used to roam all across Europe and were responsible for managing biodiversity through grazing. However, this species was hunted to extinction in 1627, but its DNA still lives on. The Tauros program aims to bring back the aurochs as a functional wild animal by backbreeding its closest relatives. It may not be exactly the same, but they hope to genetically breed this cattle to the point that it resembles as closely as possible the original aurochs, kind of like a modern day equivalent. Number seven, the ground sloth. Somebody warn Kristen Bell because I don't know if she will actually be able to handle this. The ground sloth was a massive version of the sloths we know now that existed around 8,000 years ago. Imagine a sloth combined with a giant bear. <laughs> So nice. They make the de-extinction list only because we do have DNA samples that have been extracted from a preserved strand of hair. So it could be done. The biggest problem preventing this, however, is the fact that no surviving relatives are large enough to give birth to it. But what scientists may be able to do is grow one in an artificial womb, which scientists in the Netherlands say they are within 10 years of perfecting. Number six, the stellar sea cow. When I say sea cow, you might imagine the slow and lovable manatee, and you're not entirely wrong. They kind of look like a cross between a manatee and a sea lion. The stellar sea cow is an extinct Cyrenian marine mammal, which is in the same order as the manatee. It used to live in the North Pacific Ocean during the Pleistocene and Holocene epoch and was last discovered in 1741 by the Vitus Bering's Great Northern Expedition, but disappeared by the end of the 18th century. Scientists estimate that climate changes as well as Paleolithic human hunting may have been the reason the numbers were already so low even before Europeans made the last strike. Like some others on this list, however, scientists were able to sequence the genome, which could mean we may see these creatures again one day. Number five, elephant shrew. It may surprise you to know that though a lot of big awful things might have happened, some good did come out of 2020. The elephant shrew is just one tiny but apparently mighty example. For just over 50 years, not a single elephant shrew had been spotted, which led scientists to believe that sadly this little long-nosed mouse was a lost species. Since the 1970s, any information derived from the species was found through examinations of historic specimens. But in August 2020, a team of researchers and academics reported the opposite, that they were indeed alive and apparently well. Somehow, these little creatures were able to rebuild their numbers and are now thriving across the Horn of Africa once again. Number four, the woolly mammoth. Since the film Ice Age came out, I'm sure a lot of us can't picture the animal without imagining like Ray Romano's voice along with it because that's what we do. But eventually we may not have to use only our imaginations to see real life woolly mammoths. Mammoths preserved in the permafrost in Siberia have given paleogeneticists enough data that they have been able to sequence the woolly mammoth genome, which we already know is super important. With this data, they may be able to clone the creature or edit the genetic material to its closest living relative, the Asian elephant. But it gets even cooler than that. In 2019, scientists from Japan and Russia announced a significant step towards this goal. They were able 
able to bring cells of the woolly mammoth back to life. They were able to recover cells from the hind leg of a juvenile mammoth they found in Siberia that was uncovered in 2011. They successfully implanted 28,000 year old cell nuclei into mouse cells. So though we may be very far off from actually seeing a mammoth, the kind of technology that's being developed here is astounding. Scientists hope that they can use this technology to help prevent whole species from disappearing forever. Bringing back the woolly mammoth has a lot of scientific and ethical boundaries that need to be addressed. For instance, there's social creatures you'd need to bring back a whole herd. How would you introduce them back into the wild? Yada, yada, yada. But how cool is it that extinction in the future may rarely happen again if we can master this technology? Number three, the gastric brooding frog. The cooler name of this amphibian is the Rio Batrachis, which were a kind of ground dwelling frog native to Queensland, Australia. It was one of two known frog species that was capable okay, of incubating their offspring within their stomach of the mother. She would swallow her own eggs, her stomach would stop making hydrochloric acid to avoid digestion and transform her stomach into a womb essentially. When the Anywhere from 20 to 25 tadpoles hatched, the mucus from their gills kept the acid at bay, which was super exciting for scientists because then they could figure out how to do that in humans if they were able to study them. But unfortunately, these frogs disappeared almost as soon as they were discovered. Unfortunately, both species of this weird and wonderful genus became extinct around the mid 1980s, but, but the scientists, a part of the appropriately named Lazarus Project, planned to bring it back to life. Previous cell samples of the species collected prior to the 1970s have been preserved for 40 years in a conventional freezer. In 2013, Professor Mike Archer and his colleagues announced they were able to successfully grow early stage cloned embryos containing DNA from the gastric brooding frog. Though it's taking longer than a couple of years, the Lazarus Project is still on track to bring this unique creature back to life. But it's also important to note that frogs across the world are dying from the deadly chytrid fungus, and this technology could save them all. Number two, the quagga. So they actually have brought this back, kind of. The quagga was a type of zebra that used to roam South Africa in herds before European settlers killed them all. But now scientists in Cape Town figured out how to bring them back. Quaggas had stripes very similar to zebras, but they only appeared on the front half of their bodies and are brown along the rear. Eric Harley, the project's leader, discovered that the key to bringing back this animal was through genetics, of course, as we, we know now. By testing quagga skins, they discovered that they were actually a subspecies of the zebras we know and love. Therefore, it could be possible to manifest the genes through selective breeding and they were right. They are now in the fifth generation of the breeding process and already there are less and less stripes and the appearance of a brown color. The next step would be to see if they can exact the pattern and behavioral differences between the quagga and zebras, not just the coloring. So they still got a long way to go, but really cool. Number one, the Pyrian ebex. So technically, this is the only species to ever go extinct twice. The Pyrian ebex or Bacardo became extinct back in 2000 when a fallen tree fell on the last female Celia. Sad way to go. But scientists were quick to freeze some of the cells in liquid nitrogen. With these cells, they were able to clone a calf in 2003 that was brought to life for only a few minutes before it died. Despite the loss, it was a historic event in history and the first de-extinction. Now they still plan to use the 14 year old cells of Celia, but first they must see if they are still alive. In addition to this, they are also attempting to clone embryos and implant them in female goats. So they did it once. Who is to say they won't be able to do it again? But maybe, maybe with bigger prey. Mm -hmm.